Good morning. Good morning, Allison. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? Good. Glad it's Friday. <laughs> Me too. This week felt very long, and I'm glad Friday has arrived. I should say, for whoever is watching or attempting to watch live, which I think right now is zero people, I don't know 100% where we're streaming because... Please stop. Uh, yes. Please stop <laughs> yes, I had my girlfriend cut my hair because it was just like too much. I just couldn't take it anymore. It had to go. So, yes, okay. it looks super Thank cute, doesn't haircut. it? Yes. Okay, good. We weren't 100% sure because um, wonderful Mary, who schedules these things for us, um, is on vacation. Is on vacation and we didn't call her at home to have her schedule it. And obviously, neither of us have yet learned how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we have to learn when Mary knows? So. I uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and I, it was like an anniversary episode, however many episodes they had, and the person was like, you know, welcome to the, the podcast, the, the podcast we just started one day and apparently have continued to do week after week, and now here we are, and I was like, oh, that's like Lattes with Librarians. Yeah, I was like, let's do this this summer, and like, it's October, and we're still doing it. So. <laughs> this is the show that we started doing, and I guess are continuing to do. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Audrey said it's cute too. Thanks. It I love it. Cute. It's light and it fun. <laughs> yes. yes, it is very cute. Um, so how's it going? <laughs> good, 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 good. It's been a busy week. And yeah. yeah. So yeah, I I I I want to know a secret. Yes. My mom totally shocked me. She suggested I get a puppy. Are you gonna get a puppy? I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. Yeah. I, I I had two dogs and I had to put my older dog down earlier this summer. And my other dog has been very clingy. Like he's 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 lonely. And you know, she's she's here with him and she's like, Hi needs a puppy. <laughs> and, I mean but she, so but my mom pretends to be very anti-animal for her. So for her to suggest that I get a puppy is like that's yeah. big. Movie. Well, you know, I think that probably that would make the days more enjoyable for your other dog. And I bet the other dog also might pretend like he's anti other dogs because he's older and he's like, what is this young puppy? What is all this energy? But I bet that they would fall in love in the end. I Oh, I think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think that animals like having... And then it also, I mean, but your mom is home, so that helps. But like, especially if you're not home or they're home alone a lot, I think having a companion, they at least can entertain each other and annoy each other and get in trouble together. You know, Kai is, he's 10 years old, but he's so playful. Like he Good. just loves to like run and wrestle. And um, when Ashi got older, he wasn't doing that very much anymore. And, I, think a wrestle buddy. That. I bet a puppy would love to wrestle. So if you hear about anyone who's got puppies, let me know. All right. That sounds great. That would be a great project. I have a, a friend who recently adopted a greyhound puppy. And then I have another friend who's looking to get a puppy in the near future because she is now working from home pretty much forever. essentially, yeah. And so she'll be able to be home with it and, you know, get a puppy trained and acclimated in a way that like someone who goes to work all day can't so much. You know, so she's, so she can actually commit to something like a puppy. If I ever got a dog, I would have to get an adult dog that was trained. I, yeah. I, I, I haven't had a puppy in years. Both, both of my dogs were rescue dogs. So they came to me um, mm -hmm. as adults, you know, they were both yeah. like, close to two ish when I got yeah. them. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, have, I haven't had a puppy. So, well, that's exciting. I don't know if it's going to happen, and I don't know if it's going to happen anytime soon. But I've I've been looking at, at you know like pound boards and animal shelters, and they've got lots of big dogs. Yeah. And I have you know both of my dogs were Shih Tzus, so I'm used to a smaller dog. So looking at those big dogs is a little intimidating. Yeah. Oh, that is so 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 cute. I look at those boards too, and I don't even have plans to get a dog. Sometimes I just look at them and I pick my favorite one, and then I screenshot it and I send it to everyone I know, and I'm like, "Oh, look at little Brad," or whatever. And then everyone's like, "Go adopt him," and then I'm like, "Oh, I can't." And then that like gets it out, and then then I then I can move on for a while. Audrey says getting a dog is in her five year plan. So 
Good. That sounds like a good part. Five month plan, maybe? Let's make it the five month plan. There you go. All the rules are out the window in 2020. <laughs> So we came today, we were considering talking about, we, we talked beforehand, we've mentioned this before, we have a very official discussion the day before this show about what we're going to talk about very Thursday at late afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're all, I feel like we're always, we're always percolating, you know, but like, yeah. what's the point of talking Monday when we could talk Thursday afternoon? Um, and so we were quite a boat time to find books we want to talk about. Oh yeah, or like time to invest <laughs> to research something. No. Um. So oh, Audrey said she's two years into the five year plan. So it's really only like three years. That's good. Nice. Yeah, man, I'm impressed by the commitment to the five year plan. Right. Like I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't know that I could. I don't. I don't know that I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer got a midlife crisis puppy when her only child left for college. I love oh my that. Gosh. I yeah. think that's great. I think that's a great time to get yeah. a new animal. That actually also or reminds me. Nest syndrome. Well, that, that reminds me. I saw this clickbait thing online recently um, about a couple who did um, a photo shoot for when their kids went to college. And it was just like the couple and they were like empty. It was like an empty nest photo shoot where they were like, re-getting their life back or whatever and so you know kind of like not like a pregnancy announcement shoot but like everyone's gone and now it's us again and we get to just do this again <laughs> that, you, kind know, of you know you know they do those boudoir shoot, bedroom photo shoots <laughs> i saw one where they did it with a skeleton for halloween and it was absolutely hysterical the photos are just oh my gosh or something else. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'll have to look that up. And you know what? Speaking of skeletons, I just, this was a whole year ago, but I'm going to give a shout out because we didn't have a show then. Um, to, was it Lancaster Parks and Rec who last October held the nuptials of two skeletons at Alley Park, um, dug up and rose up, well, Doug and Rose got married and um, it all happened over the course of about a week. And those posts, I can't, those, those Facebook posts were hysterical. It's amazing. It's worth going back through the Fairfield. Is it Parks and Recreation? Lancaster Parks and Recreation, I think. I think it was them, yeah. Okay, so it's worth getting on their Facebook page and scrolling back through a year. I think it was a year ago last week because I got the, the memory on my phone because I would screenshot all of them because I thought they were so great. And it was the skeleton. There was an engagement and a wedding, and there were photos of all of it, and it was just really wonderful. And the work they put into it, I was just – brought me so much joy i love this time of year and the decorations and the the creativity people put into halloween so yeah yes well you're a really creative person too you put a lot of creativity into halloween also both you and your sister your costume yeah. people and uh so you if anyone should appreciate it i mean you know how much work it takes <laughs> yes she uh yeah. she did a practice run of her Halloween makeup this morning and sent me pictures. So nice to seeing her Halloween costume. Leah, are you dressing up this year? I I think I have to. It's kind of expected. Well, you didn't right. last year. I know I didn't. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't know if you know. I know. Well, no, I I did. I did. I I did. Um. The, the Rosie the Riveter last year. I was, it was one of those, my, the big costume I had planned, something didn't work and I got okay. very discouraged and at the last minute I just did a, an easy okay. thing. Because, That's what I was remembering. Yeah. What I had planned on didn't happen. All right. Okay. Do you have, so I guess, I guess my question then is, do you have like a big plan this year? Not yet. Okay. So you're not like trying the last year's again with a different, like you're not, you didn't, Figure out um, I maybe put on some weight during quarantine and what I, all. what I the dress I bought for last year's costume might not fit anymore. That mm -hmm. may have happened. Who's to say? It all <laughs> just shrunk while being in storage for a year. Yes, that that's very possible. I think that that's what happened to the shirt I had on originally this morning that <laughs> I put on. I was like, well, that you know, I wore this last year. It's that time again this year, you know, and I put it on and I'm like, something happened to this shirt. Right. <laughs> yes. 
the elves came and they tightened up the seams. Yes, it definitely wasn't the uh, the COVID nineteen. It was definitely something with the shirt. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> well, speaking of COVID nineteen, um, <laughs> we were talking yesterday about books that we could like vicariously travel through, sort of, or just things because we can't travel now. Yes. And we talked a little bit about the entire cart of travel books I have that I'm supposed to be cataloging, but I put off because no one, I mean, half, half of those books were not allowed in those countries right now. And that doesn't mean that people wouldn't be planning their trips. But when I have things come in and I'm like, well, this stuff, brand new fiction withholds, tra travel books for countries that banned us, I'm going to do the ones that have holds in our brand new fiction. So I just haven't done them yet. Yeah. Um, so we do have a bunch of new travel books coming once I get my act together. A lot of them have maps in the back, perforated maps, and we pull those out and put them like in a little pocket so that you can take the time to pull up. <laughs> yeah, um, and you don't have to pull out the perforations and everything. So that's like another layer too of like, we gotta make those little pockets. But um, so anyway, we're talking about that, how I've got all those travel books and how we can't really travel anywhere. And sometimes reading is one way to escape. <laughs> yes, <laughs> reading is always an escape. But sometimes it's like, you know, more of an adventure than other times, yeah. Yes. Oh, and Audrey says that the summer humidity made my shirt shrink and your dress. So I think that makes perfect sense. I hate humidity yeah. anyway, so there's one more thing. It did. It ruined my wardrobe. Mm -hmm. oh. We're talking about traveling and books and humidity. I lived in Japan for two years, and oh my God, the humidity over there was awful. Like, like it was just not something that I thought about before going there like you know it just it was awful like it's like wearing a wet wool sweater as soon as you walk out of the door sometimes in the summer but um one of the books i picked up was about japan and um it's about a girl who travels to japan and she teaches english there mm -hmm. and um if you follow me by lena watros um and there's a it's it's funny because it talks about um, <clears throat> one of the things is um, she's, she goes there to escape some stuff that she doesn't want to deal with and she keeps throwing away her garbage and her, like keeps getting returned to her and it's like, you know some things you can't just get away from but um, <laughs> it's really funny because Japan is actually very strict about garbage yeah I thought when you said that my mind was I thought that yes yeah, and like you have to sort your garbage certain ways and there are certain things that you throw out on certain days. And like when I got there, there was like this garbage schedule that the woman in my office gave me and she like translated it. And I was just like, but it's wow. just, but it's like, you've got like certain garbage like that 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 is burnable and certain garbage that mm -hmm. isn't. And it was just like very, very strict rules for garbage. And it's That's one of funny in this story it's a funny yeah thing that keeps happening to her her, her yeah. that is, and that's something that like it means something more to you having been familiar with that part of japan like if i had read that it like the kind of like cultural nuance of that would have completely passed me by because i yeah yeah that's cool but it's one of those things like somebody read this book and they're like so like does that happen i was like yeah, when you live in rural Japan, your neighbors know you and they will bring you back your garbage and um, when it's not sorted properly. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. That's really cool, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, Liz says we can come to Colorado because there, there is no humidity, just smoke. <laughs> oh yeah, I've seen pictures. That is, that, mm. Yeah. I hope you're okay where you are. Um, and I would not have pictured Japan to be humid, not because I know anything about it, but just because you see the pictures and it seems so like crisp or something, you know, there's always like those cherry blossoms. I realize I'm picturing pictures from like one week a year. I'm aware of that, but you picture those like cherry blossoms, the trees, the blue sky and all that stuff. And it just gives you this feeling of like, I don't know, like crispness or something. I was well, not picturing being drenched. <laughs> one thing that's very odd about Japan is, um, it's very skinny. So it stretches from like, what would be like, um, like Maine yeah. down to what is Florida. So they have like the really cold oh. area and the really 
tropical area, or okay. like, you know, Okinawa is warm all the time, it mostly. Um, so like they span the whole spectrum yeah. of, of weather. And where I was was actually very similar to here. It was very cold, bitter winters um, with very little snow and very hot, humid summers. So like where I was, like longitude, longitude, latitude. Longitude is a long way. Latitude is latitudinally um, was very similar to, to Ohio, like where we are in Ohio. Okay, um, yeah. So the weather okay. was similar to, to us, hot, humid summers and that makes sense. cold winters. When you, when you were figuring out in your head, longitude or latitude, speaking <laughs> or, uh, traveling somewhere, I was suddenly just back in my sixth grade classroom, like learning longitude, long way. Like that, I, but I was like in my desk in my sixth grade classroom. <laughs> what I'm, oh, let me come back. You're, I can hear you. I don't know if everyone else can. Okay. Oh, you hear me? I can hear you. Hold on. You're showing up. There we go. Okay. Um, when I, this is awful, but when I'm driving, I will go north, east, south, west. Like, I will seriously put my finger in the air and go north, east, south, mm -hmm. west. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out, do I need the east or the west exit? Yes, oh, I know. Me too. Oh, man. Jennifer just shared a link to a book chat called Books That Take You Places. And she's oh. sharing the book list. Oh, well, how yeah. lovely of her. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Chris said, the best thing about the nature of Japan is the cherry blossom. I love the cherry blossoms. Where I was, it was very near, there was this famous tree in Morioka. Um, I lived about two hours away, but it was the um, rock splitting cherry tree. Like, like that was what its name translated to. It was this huge cherry tree that had grown um, through a rock. I mean, it was like a, a big rock, like. Wow. You know, and but like the cherry tree had grown out of it and like it was all braced up and um because it was like hundreds of years old but it was like yeah. the famous cherry tree in the area that's really cool yeah and i will we'll copy jennifer's where i'm a little uncertain i feel like like when I've watched this before, I think there's some restrictions on who can see whose comments based on your privacy settings and stuff like that. So I will copy Jennifer's link as the, and post it as the library so that everyone can see it. Just yeah. so if you're watching this right now, I'm like, what link? Um, I will we'll post that later. And Jennifer is our colleague at um, Pickerington Library. So we know it's <laughs> all about book chat. I'm sure she put together a great list for us there. Um, so when we were talking about like books that take you places or whatever, I was struggling. Um, I also, I will admit, sometimes I have a very like literal mind and I have a hard time sometimes, whatever, it's fine. Um, so I was looking at stuff and I don't, I couldn't find books that I've read that I really enjoyed that necessarily were like, took you somewhere or about a place, but I was thinking about it and I was like, okay, so take a step back. What is about those books is important? And I was thinking about like, becoming immersed in something and, you know, being immersed in an atmosphere or a setting or something like that. Um, a lot of times it's an atmosphere, I think, for me. And so I did end up pulling some. And the thing that they all have in common is that they're gigantic. And I think that perhaps for me, an immersive reading experience is a long one because then I have no choice but to be immersed because it is very long. Um, but, oh, gosh. I like those big sagas, you know. Where you get I know, yeah. Lots of detail. Well, and this you know, I'll pull this one on top, um, which I actually haven't read, but it's on my list to read and probably plenty of other people have read something by him. Um, but it's just speaking of taking to a, a specific place, Sarum by Edward Rutherford, and he's written New York, he's written Paris, um, London, I think. Yeah, Lots of just very fat, um, long ranging historical sagas. And I will, will tell you, I've wanted to read, read this for a long time, but one reason I haven't, why it hasn't made it to the top of my I feel like being immersed, what do I read pile, is because it's a mass market paperback and it's just like, it's not going to be great. <laughs> and so maybe if I can find the trade version, <laughs> maybe then I'll read it. But I got this for like a quarter at a book sale. So, you know. Do you, do you ever do ebooks? Um, Occasionally, but I only, if that's the only way to have something or to keep with me in case of emergency. Because sometimes I find like those, those really thick ones easier to consume in the ebook because yeah. you know yeah. it, you don't have the pages, it's 
so I, yeah, it's I find yeah. I find those sometimes. Yeah. And maybe that could be how I how I go about this, but something also about a long book, it just feels nice to feel to feel how but this one for someone who is you know, I like I said, I haven't read it, so I can't give you a whole lot, but it does um basically take you through English history from like primitive times until like the present, well, the present day, whenever he wrote this. But um, so that's, it's just sweeping. That's for sure. And um, that's one version of kind of being transported. I think, you know, this sweeping historical saga. <laughs> yeah. I, I love a lot of the historical ones that take you back um, to a certain place in time mm -hmm. and not, not only for the story that they share, but for learning about the time in the area. Yeah. The Outlander books by Diana Gabaldon, wonderful for that. I've talked about those several times, so I won't do that now. Um, but another book that did that that I loved, and yeah, it's totally a romance. I get it. Um, Ashes in the Wind by um, Kathleen E. Woodowis. You know, it's one of those, it's taking place during the Civil War in the South. Um, you know, there's a woman hiding you know she's disguised herself as like a man to hide in the civil war because you know to keep herself safe really um and you know it just but you get you get the the the, the whole story about you know the north be occupying the south and like mm -hmm. you know families distrust of them and yeah um, the soldier you just it's it's an interesting way of seeing that time period and um you know, because you think a lot about, oh, like, that was bad. But you also, they're, they're, they're people. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know. It was just, it was a yeah. really interesting read for mm -hmm. learning about that time period. I think. Yeah, I that's, that's another way to travel is, like, in mm -hmm. time. Um, and Chris commented, I love when an author has so much immersion into their world. And then also, the smell. there's nothing better than the smell of an old book. And I will say, I've said before, I, I buy all my books used and a lot of books that I own that I haven't read. You know, I buy a lot of books I haven't read and a lot of books I have read, but my preference is often used just because there's like something, it's like they have something to them or whatever, a history. So I get that. <laughs> um, the next, the next book that, or another book I brought, um, totally different thing, but another one where you just kind of get immersed in a world of both the politics, the culture, the landscape is Watership Down because you're pulled into all of that, but it's rabbits. Um, and I haven't, I'll admit, I haven't read this book in a long time, but I have read it, I think twice. Um, and I just remember being so pulled into this and, and picturing the Warren and again, the politics between the rabbit leaders and everything and just it was certainly not a landscape I was familiar with. I didn't have points of reference for the rabbit warren, but it was, um, you know, I do believe it includes like maps and stuff. At least I think I remember that from school. Um, and I don't know. So this was another, again, very long, very immersive. Yes, here's a very detailed map. Very immersive reading experience. <laughs> um, we have a recommendation for Into the Wilderness. By Sarah um, I have heard wonderful things about her books. Have you read any of her books? I have not. No, that name is not even familiar to me. I'll have to look it up. Oh, um, she writes really. I, I have had so many people recommend her to me. I haven't read any of okay. her books, but yeah. Um, well, I wrote it down for myself too. One of the things that I love about books that take you places, I, I'll, I'll confess, I have a fondness for books that are set in Ireland. Um, I have one here, The Pub Across the Pond, which was fun. Um, <clears throat> and right now I'm listening to The Faithful Place by um, Tana French, which I'm loving. Um, I And this one, I have it here as the book. I actually... I own it as an ebook and I borrowed it as an audio book. I love listening to books that take place in a foreign area when you have readers who do the accent. <clears throat> like, is that in my mind, like when I'm hearing the accent, it really kind of like helps me get in the mind space of that, that area. And it just, I, I love that. I love hearing the voice, the the voice, you know, and them saying, that makes sense. 
is. Yeah, and even even in books where the again where the actual setting maybe isn't that important. I um, read a book where truthfully the setting was nothing at all. It was a memoir, but the per- person um, telling the story it was set. It was a the person the story is about is from New Zealand, and the person who read the book was from New Zealand. And so it just for some reason that really it just made me feel like I really knew that person because I could hear what their world sounded like. Jennifer said that she went to uh, school with Mary Carter, the author of this book, The Pub Across the Pond. Oh my gosh. So that is awesome. That is really cool. Pub Across the Pond, Mary Carter. Jennifer knows her. <laughs> that is cool. All right, what book next? Um, okay, if we're gonna talk about like an atmosphere to a book, I realized that some of the things that really pulled me in had a somewhat, sorry, I'm reaching through my pile, um, a somewhat like almost like gothic atmosphere, several books in my pile. That's just like something that really does kind of pull you in. It gives you, I picture fogginess. I picture, uh, you know, kind of a, an immense landscape and, and I don't know, there are different books, but the atmosphere still kind of retains that gothic um feeling. But one book that I think a lot of people have probably read, but that is extremely atmospheric, um, or again, with the fog and the mist, but maybe not really gothic, set in Spain is The Shadow of the Wind. Mm. Um, yeah. This is just, it's a magical, sort of magical realism book, a little bit. There's like stuff to it, um, but it's just really it's its own world. It's kind of like a magical realism, Spain. And um, again, just like lots of streets full of fog and mysterious people and then books, lots of stuff about books. And um, this one will, and if there's more, there's technically three, maybe four books in this series. They're all also pretty. And you can read them in any order, even though they are chronological, you can kind of read them in any in any way. And um they're just really, the language is really, really good in these two. It's yeah. just. One of the books that I love, um, and I saw that the last book in this series is coming out, um, Mistress of the Art of Death by Ari- Ariana Franklin. Mm-hmm. Um, it She is like the medieval temperance Brennan. Like she, she <laughs> you know, she goes in and she, um, understands like the way the body works and she kind of mm-hmm. solves the murder knowing the 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 anatomy and like mm-hmm. the way disease works and all of that but it's just it's it's i find these really fascinating and um i think i think the first one starts out there like on a pilgrimage to to um Canterbury. I could be wrong about that. I could be making that up. I might have just made that up. But um, <clears throat> for some reason, that's what I feel. Yeah. Um, it's true now. You made it true. It's, it's been a couple of years since I read it. This came out in 2009. So no, yeah. I need to go back and reread it. But I feel like there's there's they're traveling in the English countryside. Where and, I don't know. And it's medieval, set in like the medieval. Yes, yes. Cool. And um, but so the the narrator for these books, I forget who does the narration for the audio. Her voice is perfect. Like it puts you in that time. Yeah. Like it, in the and like the way she delivers the. There's something magical about how well the narration fits this book. Like it's just that's cool. Phenomenal. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, let's see. I'll pull one more. Um, again, I hit on that gothic thing, which several things like can fit in that, like Rebecca, which there's a new Netflix, going to be a new Netflix movie of Rebecca, um, which is exciting, but I'm going to pull this one because it's different than what we've talked about, um, so far. And this is one where I can picture scenes of it, which isn't always the case for me in a book. I haven't read it since eighth grade, but I, I sit down in it again. I can picture the landscape really well. And that's the Grapes of Wrath. Like, very the setting of the grapes of wrath you know the dust bowl in Oklahoma again haven't read it since eighth grade so I don't I if I'm not saying the correct place names I'm so sorry but um the landscape definitely sticks with you and the way that the landscape 
like imprints and in, the characters inhabit it and it imprints on them and just that barrenness and everything has really always stuck with me. Like I said, I remember my what my vision anyway of what places looked like in the Grapes of Wrath. Well, that's one of the things that I find it really funny is we, we read these books and we, I, for me anyway, there are people out there who remember in very great detail exactly what happens. I don't do that. Like I remember how it left me feeling like the impressions that I had. So like, maybe this wasn't like a pilgrimage to Canterbury. Maybe it made me think of the Canterbury tale because of yeah. they were taking, I think they were on some kind of pilgrimage and there was like, a, so like, but like they leave you with a feeling like, Ooh, that was good. Or, Ooh, that was sophisticated. Or, Ooh, that was, you know, that was just yeah. like funny. But yeah. the, the, the specific details are, are gone like character name yeah really the way <clears throat> like i'll remember oh like that was fast paced or mm -hmm. you know that was you know it took you some time to get into it but yeah. the specifics sometimes yeah i i think you're right about that how a book leaves you feeling is like the yeah. most important thing and when you reflect back on it and i think that's why i picked the books that i did because they're ones that I felt like I lived in for a little while. And then when I left them, like I remembered living in them. And yes. some books I reflect on, like it was funny or some books are like the language was incredible or whatever. But these were books that I felt like I lived in them. Yes. And Jennifer just made a recommendation and I have to say, I love this I book. I have that on my table. I just bought it. It's on my, it's on my coffee table to read soon. I loved that book. The Historian by Elizabeth Costova, um, it it's so good, and it's like this, you know, you know, you, you, he goes on the adventure to find out the truth, and he's like traveling across the world, and he ends up in Budapest, and he just, you know, yeah. starts out he's he's in a library, and then it just kind of like snowballs from there, and it just yeah, that book was really I, good. I read Dracula last year, and I really, really, really liked it. And um, so I ha I bought that book um, a couple of months ago. It's on my table and it was something I was going to pull for this because it suggests to me the type of book that I wanted to read, but I hadn't read it. So I didn't know if that was going to be accurate or not. So thank you, Jennifer. Now I know it will be and I'm eager to read it. I actually thought about pulling that book. Too. <laughs> well, here we go. We all using our librarian detective skills and we were right on point, but uh, none of us. Okay. We, neither was brought it, so I'm good. Maybe I'll read that next because I am looking for something to pull me in. I really like that book, so nice. And Chris says, Dragonstorm the Elder Saga by K.R. Frazier, new author, kind of tokenish, and a good friend of mine. Awesome, I love it when people know authors. I know <laughs> that's a great recommendation, and probably we should wrap up here. But that Tolkien is another very, um, yeah takes you their author um for sure and i did have to stop reading that i was in the two towers and i was like i cannot i cannot with this landscape description i just can't keep going man and um but that is definitely he is very much in this category too fantasy is because yeah it's, it's all about world building you know the world that they build is just so important to the story often. Yeah. So, yeah yeah and so actually tolkien for a while made me think i didn't like books like that because i couldn't get into that and as it turns out there are other ones but i just oh it was a lot <laughs> <laughs> i've heard such mixed reviews about tolkien's books people are like they love them or they're like oh, slugging through them <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, so I just said it was one of those books that was kind of formative. It helped me figure out what I like and what I don't like, which is a great thing. And I really did enjoy The Hobbit. It was when I got into the ones that were a lot more serious and like world building. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was great to chat today. Yeah, some, and thank you for all of the recommendations. Yes. And I love it. I love when we talk about books. So. Oh my gosh, yes. We'll get the... We'll put that list and try to put some of the recommendations then um, in this post. I sound hesitant because I'm like, oh, Mary isn't here. Right? How dare she go on vacation? I know. We'll figure it out. We'll get it done. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.